All right, so hi everybody. Welcome to another chat on area. Today, I'm very, very privileged to have Johan Lambeck from the Netherlands joining me. So get yourselves a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, or a glass of wine, whatever time of day it might be for you, and sit back, relax, and enjoy whilst I talk to this very um, knowledgeable and experienced gentleman. So hi, Johan. Hello, that's a um, privilege also for me, and uh, it's uh, nice to talk to you. Yeah, and to talk a bit about um, our common our common interest, aquatic therapy. Absolutely, absolutely. So Johan's from, as I say, from the Netherlands, and but he travels and teaches and presents across the world. And um, in fact, I last met you in Las Vegas when we went to ISPAT. But before we get to talking about what ISPAT is and what they do, tell me a little bit about your journey. How did you start off? in the aquatic industry? Yeah, well, as a child, I was a swimmer. Yeah, a competitive swimmer. I was always in the pool in the little village in Netherlands where I come from. And then um, um, starting, starting uh, physiotherapy. And in these days, I was all, uh, also um, a lifesaver in a public pool yeah, in summer. And I did a course in swimming teaching at the same time. So at yeah. the end of, of the curriculum, we had a thesis and I decided to combine both and write a thesis about which you cannot compare with the thesis nowadays. That's 40 years ago. It was just copy paste, so to say. <laughs> um, but anyway, it was about uh, finally uh, swimming for children with a CP. And um, I was supported then by one of our teachers, who at that moment was the head of physiotherapy of a large rehab center here in Nijmegen, that's uh, the, the name in, of the city in the Netherlands where I come from. And he told me, you know, when you're ready um, and you have your, done your explanation, we have a, a job for you because we do have a swimming pool, but nothing so much happens. So I started to work there and I got carte blanche in good English. Um, uh, in order to increase quality and uh, quantity of the aquatic therapy there. And um, this institute, St. Martin's Clinic, um, nowadays uh, has something like 90 to 100 physiotherapists. It's huge, yeah, with wow. um, all the pediatrics, yeah, a couple of schools, um, orthopedics, rheumatology, uh, rehabilitation, yeah, neuro, uh, prosthesis, okay, everything together. So it's enormous. Thing and 40 years ago it was a bit smaller but still the same mm -hmm. and when I was uh, reading for my thesis uh, which by the way for the younger people there was no google or whatever so you had to go to libraries in universities um, I found something about Halliwick and that was a swimming method that also had therapeutic um, effects as they say so when I started to work my boss um, asked me which you like to do in terms of education. And so I would like to uh, do a LAB course, of course. So I had an address in England you know, of the secretary of the AST, Association, Association of Swimming Therapy at that moment. And um, one month later, there was a reply or something that Macmillan, the founder of Halibic was living in Switzerland and I should inform him. So I wrote to him Three months later, <laughs> the time delay was enormous at that moment. There was a reply uh, that yes, um, he was uh, teaching Halibut courses in Bad Ragaz, but that just stopped. He quit the center. And so then we got the idea uh, to ask him to come to the Netherlands. And in 1982, uh, he came for the first time. It was organized by our rehab center, by the university Hospital of Nijmegen and by the NDT Foundation of this area. Um, and that was the beginning, in fact, of my, of my teaching career in, uh, in Halliwick uh, then. So... I didn't know that. I mean, I knew Halliwick was English, but I didn't know that he'd gone over to Badoga and then to you in the Netherlands. That's fascinating. Oh, yes, that's a, that's a long story. And I hope I tell the truth. <laughs> um, because there are different sides of the truth also, always. But 
Um, and Macmillan um, started to teach in, in Bad Ragaz in 1963. He and his wife then were invited to do a course over there. And in the early 70s, he started to work there as a, uh, the leader of a project group to develop aquatic therapy. So from the Halewick theory and practice, they decided to develop something that was more applicable to aquatic therapy for the adults that they um, had and have in the rehab center of Valence. Valence is a little village which is close to Bad Regatz in the eastern part of Switzerland. And that finally became water specific therapy then. So that's, uh, and then Macmillan uh, stayed there uh, first a year and then actually he, um, he lived in Switzerland until his death, which was in 1993 then. Good so. Um, we started to invite Macmillan uh, actually until his death and I once counted that um, I was with him for some 30 courses in both the Netherlands and Switzerland and um, of course bit by bit I started to teach a little bit to demonstrate patients and um, okay then, then he died and, and then people started to ask me if I could teach the course etc and uh, so hmm. that's, the that's, the part. that's the hell of a big part of my of my development, so to say. Yeah. yeah, fascinating. So it was a sort of a naturally evolving, really. I think very much like my own career, it's sort of like naturally evolved. And I, and I tend to find talking to people in aquatic therapy, it seems to come find you rather than you going and finding it. Uh, yes. Uh, I was also um, uh, supported by, by my, my boss who said, you know, um, you have to specialize. And of course, that was the idea also with my position in the rehab center. Although I worked there for 20 years, then I quit. Um, I always said from the very beginning that I didn't want to become a full-time aquatic therapist. Uh, as physiotherapists, they also want to see people on dry land. So for some 50 to 60%, I was in charge of, of, um, of the pool, the pools later. Um, and the rest of the time I worked on land. So I was a kind of rotational um, exception within our teams. I worked a couple of years in spinal cord injury, then in neurorehabilitation, uh, then orthopedics and rheumatology, uh, even a bit of heart cardiac rehabilitation that we had also on dry land in order not to lose uh, that aspect. Uh, yes. So that's one of the, um, the thoughts that I have nowadays yeah, with all the, the colleagues, especially completing core therapy and might not see all the other important things that are important for our patients as well. Um, but okay, yeah. So, and then um, there was another course uh, of 35 years ago, and that was the, the Bath course, yeah, and the Royal uh, National Hospital of Rheumatic Diseases uh, there. And um, so I wanted to do this course, this course also. And the first time I had contact with England was in preparing um, a conference that we um, organized at the University for Hellewick, Hellewick in 1986, where I asked Ron Harrison um, of the famous articles about weight bearing uh, to come over to the Netherlands, but he just retired, so he didn't come. Um, and there was also the year that more or less I wanted to go uh, to England, but the course wasn't organized um, until Ah, now I forgot her name. Um, a colleague then took over, um, Helen Whitelock, yes, uh, took over. And so I went there in, um, in 1993, then finally, uh, 1991, <laughs> um, okay, early 90s, uh, finally. And I think I was the first one from outside the, 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 uh, the Commonwealth, yeah, yeah. To, uh, to be able to join that course then. So that was another... Uh, learning aspect. That's also the place where I first learned about the Badrugatz ring method and then later of course when I was teaching in Badrugatz following up Macmillan and developing the course over there I learned much more about Badrugatz. So that's another kind of separate separate road. Yeah amazing. I don't believe, I mean I, I could stand corrected but I don't believe that Bath run any courses anymore because no look for them and then mm -hmm. yeah, and then speaking yes. to some of the um, <coughs> ATACP, which is the English Aquatic Therapy Chartered Physiotherapists 
um, group. Yeah. They they told me that it's not being run anymore. So. No, that's been a long time ago. That's true. Yeah. Very yeah. sad. Yeah. yeah. So now they run their own courses. Then especially uh, Jackie Petman is the one that. Yes, most, Jackie. I think. Yeah. Yeah, Jackie, I know well. Yeah, and also um, who else was telling me? Oh, Hilary Austin, who does the Watsu over here. She was saying that it's it's not in Bath anymore. So it's just now. I think the individual pockets that are sort of like running the courses and things. So. Um, yes, indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you, so you've um, so you, you started off with the Halliwick then, and then you you sort of went into the Badagar arena. Is that is that correct? Yeah, and in mm -hmm. in aquatic therapy in gen in general, but yeah. actually there's one step in between, and that is that from my swimming career as a, as a boy and swimming teacher, I also did a course <clears throat> in swimming coach for the disabled, in uh, with the Dutch Association of swimming for the disabled mm -hmm. and where after after this course they asked me directly to come into the technical technical committee and then change to the education committee um, so there was around 1988 when i was the assistant coach of the dutch paralympic team and physiotherapist but i found it so boring uh, just um, walking walking past the bath side with the with a chronometer um, in your hand and I changed to the education committee. So that was, as I say, 1987, more or less, that I changed. And then for the five years after, um, I taught all over the country uh, for um, swimming groups for the disabled that were part of the association. Mm -hmm. um, about, uh, not about only Hellevik, but also about lifting techniques and all these things that are important for, uh, for lay people and et cetera. And Absolutely. It also meant, that we decided not to run a specific um, Hellebic association in the Netherlands, yeah, because all the disabled swimmers, they were already swimming in a kind of structure and the, the structure then adopted Hellebic also. So there was another, <clears throat> another thing. And through this system of swimming for the disabled, I met uh, two, uh, two persons from the University of Leuven in Belgium, Rick Persijn and Dan Daly. And, um, then Daly at some moment took over from this Ulrich Persein um, for the swimming part uh, of the Faculty of Limitation and Movement Sciences over there. And he asked me to come there. So I've been, after I quit the rehab center, um, I've been 10 years involved um, as a free research assistant of, uh, of the Faculty of, of Limitation Sciences. So in there we did all kinds of Erasmus projects in order to, um, to justify the use of aquatic therapy with projects like um, aqua evidence, um, mm -hmm. aqua outcome, aqua validity, and so on. Um, until then, Daly then retired and the university decided to stop the project. Yeah, that oh, was that's a shame. Uh, yeah, some seven years ago, I think, yeah. Yes. I tried to put, I tried to put it together, in fact, uh, so I do have the clinical experience of long time. Okay, I'm out of directly clinical practice. And I mostly teach, but in my courses, I always see patients, apart from the last 16 months, of course, I have a kind of uh, yeah. uh, early retirement, so to say, but it's coming, will come again. Yeah, like, um, yeah, I think over the pandemic lockdowns period, I was able to use my manual skills in, so I was I was still working. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's nice. Yeah, whereas <laughs> I had time to finally really go through all the articles that you always want to read ah, and, and yes. just just pile up. Um, and of course, then we started to organize our uh, our webinars based on our previous experiences with our conferences. Um, yeah. So, from that all. Um, going back to Hellewick, then Macmillan died. And uh, during his life, he never wanted to organize uh, or establish a kind of international association where we asked this to him when we had our conference in 1986. Uh, but after his death, we came together. It was also in Switzerland, inviting people from his agenda, knowing 
that they were doing Halavik in various places in the world, of course, also in the UK. And um, we established the International Halavik Association. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a mix of countries that were focused on, on swimming, on therapy, uh, or a mix whatever. So that um, worked for some time, but at some moment, um, I myself, but also other colleagues, were a bit unsatisfied with the fact that there was quite a focus on swimming. We would like to have more aquatic therapy, aquatic physiotherapy. And that was the start of what we have now, the association IATF, yeah, which is then related to uh, this rehabilitation center close to Bad Ragaz in Switzerland. Yeah. And the mission of this IATF is to um, um, is to, to spread the word about aquatic therapy yeah, based on um, clinical reasoning, on evidence-based on evidence practice and so on. Yeah, um, where you finally come to, let's say, exercise in the pool based on the clinical reasoning process that includes not only your preferences or the preference of the patients, uh, which is very important, the knowledge, yeah, the experience that you have gained, but also the external evidence, yeah, so all the literature. Um, and in that mix, then at some moment, we also said, okay, we have to, um, uh, to start again with, uh, with conferences, uh, as we had in 1986. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Conferences, I think, are sort of really important now nowadays for people, because we all have to keep our CPDs up to date. Um, so we have to, you know, have X amount of hours per year of training. So I think conferences are, are really good. And, and the short workshops and things are really good for people to keep and to keep their skills up to date. Because I remember like yourself, when I came into, uh, I started off with teaching swimming and back then you didn't need to, to sort of update your skills or anything like that. You, you qualified as a swimming teacher and then you could have done your entire career yeah. out upskilling at all. And yet every Olympics, you know, the technique changes slightly. There's always something that someone's managed to tweak on it. So it's the same with therapy. I think we do need those, those CPDs and those um, conferences. So have you been doing conferences like online, Johan? Um, yes. Of course, during the pandemics, we, uh, we did this. I mean, there were many that have done this. Um, in, in different different formats. So our format um, was based on the previous ISABET conferences. Eh? We had five, yeah, and the, the latest one was then in, in Las Vegas, and there was one planned in uh, in Beijing, in, in China, yeah, just after the start of the pandemics. So obviously it was cancelled. Um, where the idea was that we want to to mix theory and practice, of course, that is always evidence practice. Um, so with a couple, a couple of practical topics, yeah, because most of the participants finally are clinicians, um, and then and then supported by theory, and not only theory from aquatic therapists, but also theory uh, from people that um, either have published uh, about aquatic therapy. So you do have researchers that hardly have been in the pool, but yeah, they, 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 probably, they publish nice things. Um, but also people from outside, outside the aquatic therapy. Yeah? So uh, also thinking now out of the box uh, a little bit, um, based on, let's say, the state of art of, uh, of healthcare, which of course is, is changing um, uh, quickly. Yeah? And that means that always new topics that might be interesting to try to implement um, in aquatic therapy. And, yeah. um, the, the red line, in fact, uh, in all these conferences has been um, when you go into the pool with somebody who has difficulties moving on land, try to stimulate moving in water. Yeah, so yeah. movement um, with some kind of intensity uh, um, and then based on the goals of the patients and the outcomes that you can realize to reach those goals in water, yeah, in comparison to land, yeah, it was in fact the basis of ISABAT. Um, and then to your question, 
and after those those conferences, we uh, we continued this uh, last year with um, five sessions and two pre and two pre recorded ones uh, online. Yeah, indeed. Excellent. It's uh, and is is it something that you'd need to be a physical therapist or physiotherapist to join, or can people who are doing um, sort of like rehabilitation or got an interest in rehabilitation are they able to join and, and upskill as well? <laughs> in general, <laughs> um, yeah. Look, I myself I'm eclectic, so so to say. Um, yeah. Uh, and my, my roots are rehabilitation, where there's always a team that works around the patient and everybody does his or her part. There's logic, uh, the physio, the occupational therapist, and so on and so on. And it also comes for the product therapy. Yeah. There's a gray area. There are things that can be done by various disciplines and there are things that are more specific to one, to one profession. Um, Absolutely. And, that, and that means that in our courses, uh, normally we don't make restrictions other than that people should work in healthcare. Yeah. Um, and so they are, they are allowed to use, let's say the techniques that we teach in courses uh, to their patients. Um, although of course that's always a personal uh, choice uh, uh, yeah. and that depends on the country also uh, clearly. Absolutely. Uh, but on the other hand, we also teach courses as let's say Macmillan started in England, for instance, um, with the, the Swiss Hellenic Association, which is an association of parents. Originally, um, parents that wanted to go into the pool with their disabled children mm -hmm. uh, and wanted to know how to handle and how to get uh, progress, etc. Uh, so also, also that kind of courses uh, um, we teach, but then clearly, and that's also what we have learned from experience, we always say that uh, you will not become a Hellwig therapist or something like this. Um, uh, you are a sports teacher and you do Hellwig or Badrakats or whatever kind of method and you're always a sports teacher. Um, yeah. But, you know, with that knowledge within the scope of your profession. Absolutely. I mean, that's something I advocate over here all the time is stay within your accredited guidelines, stay with it, you know, stay within your... Um, sort of your your ability really not not to step beyond and to claim that you're something that you're not but I, I see a lot of a lot of carers come into the pool with their charges with their their patients or family members or whatever and just getting them out of the wheelchairs because I'm very very lucky there's very few pools in the UK that got a wheelchair ramp mm -hmm. I think at the last count there was three and luckily enough, I'm one. At, I work at one of the three, so you see them sort of like wheel somebody into the wheelchair and either tip them out at the other end, or sort of you know stick about half a dozen noodles around them, and you know that just they get face planted and everything. It's just it's quite scary. So teaching them how to to handle would be phenomenal, definitely. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's quite important. Look. The good thing, of course, of course, is that they come out of the wheelchair and they go into the pool. Yes. Uh, because the sitting life is not good at all. Uh, no. Sitting kills. No, um, absolutely. But then, but then you would like to achieve the things that otherwise you could not achieve. And that cannot be done by just hanging uh, around the pool then. And yeah. then you would like to, to get people uh, physically active and mentally active. And this is something you don't do in a, in a lean chair. And uh, you know, on, on the beach, yeah, yes. but on a, on a wobbling chair, uh, uh, more or less, so to say. Um, but it's a bit also the uh, the fight that we have for for decades, uh, also based on Macmillan's handling. Mm -hmm. um, that is, uh, try to 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 challenge, yeah, because only with challenging a system, and it doesn't matter if this is a, let's say, the system of your facial, or if this is your facial system. Yeah, you can make a tissue system, a logical system, or your muscles, or whatever kind of system that we have. And when the stimulus is not high enough, there is no adaptation. So, and that is something that we then uh, also try to, to say clearly. And yeah, you've been in Las Vegas where uh, dosage 
yeah, it was clearly an important topic. Yeah, also an introductory speech by, by Paula Geigel, for instance, mm -hmm. to say to therapists especially, um, make your people active and make them tired also. Yeah, to say yeah. black and white. Um, and as a physiotherapist, I can say this, I see uh, many colleagues that after two or three repetitions asking the patients, are you tired? <laughs> <laughs> You right. should be tired, yeah. um, mm. um, and so yeah. So <clears throat> that is the that is the the the, the, yeah, the other important topic that we try to uh, to tell the world that in the in the pool, of course, you can perfectly relax. I agree completely with this, and um, um, I also know what's so another kind of practice, another uh, another kind of um, uh, passive passive uh, concept, so to say. Uh, but most of the patients they want to move and and um, for this we have all kinds of uh, of methods that also go beyond beyond uh, beyond Hellewick. Yeah, it's not only Hellewick that is important in life of course yeah and, and that's what we see also nowadays and especially it was triggered also in our in our association by the pandemics is that many of the persons that have the the long-term problems uh, of uh, of COVID uh, are just the, the, the just the, 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 the intense problems of uh, long COVID um, had a lifestyle disease. Yeah, so our focus was much more on can we um, try to educate the use of aquatic exercise, not only aquatic therapy but also aquatic exercise. Yeah to people that have a lifetime problem, maybe in order to prevent yeah, also a little bit that they have to go to intensive care or to hospital um, anyway. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, we it, life has become so sedentary in general, even pre-pandemic, and now it's just so much worse. You know, people are sort of coming to the pool and, and are completely locked, you know, all their tissues are locked and everything. And that's on... You know, people that aren't even in a wheelchair. So, if you're sort of like stuck in that wheelchair and you can't move much, we need to get them as free as they can. As free as yes, they can. indeed. And of course, we always thought about not only the um, direct effects on coordination, but also in preventing orthopedic problems. Yeah, and later the the realization came um, that you also have to prevent um, cardiovascular problems. Of course, that uh, that will come. By now we know that what is good for your heart is good for your brain. Uh, actually, what is good for your brain, good is for your heart, is also good for your intestines and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and finally, and finally, of course, by by doing exercise in the pool, you see the sleep quality increases, and sleeping is another very important topic, also. Um, so these are yeah, so these are all topics that were not important 30 years ago, but uh, but but and now they are but then and this is how we I have think, to profile yeah i think also that we are actually starting to think about the body a lot more holistically rather than you know separate systems that we you know we it used to be that we were made up of these separate systems and that they sort of worked almost independently whereas now we do have a much more holistic view which I think is much healthier for us yes indeed and apart from that um, of course, it has to be expressed in research, yeah, because we everybody always looks at research and it's important, yeah, this external evidence. And so, one of the other topic, important topics in my life or in IATF life um, is looking at evidence. And uh, quite recently, um, I collected the, um, the conclusions of some nine systematic reviews that were published in the last three years on stroke and aquatic therapy with various conclusions, by the way, based on the same literature, that's uh, already interesting. Yeah. Um, but the other conclusion is mostly that um, what you can derive from the existing uh, uh, clinical trials is that um, the, there's low evidence quality uh, for aquatic therapy. And so we're just discussing now if we have to make a kind of position statement uh, on this, um, let's say explaining researchers that 
they have to be careful also uh, by choosing their patients well, not only for clinical trials, but for aquatic therapy in general. Yeah. Um, so what we see is a big heterogeneity uh, then in, uh, in research where you do have patients, you know, that, um, that are more fit than I am, uh, so to say, doing the same exercises as patients that have uh, one-tenth of my fitness. Um, and, and so you mix this all and statistically you have nothing. So yeah. to say. Well, I, I found that when I did my study that um, sort of when I was obviously reading the literature to, to write my, my paper, that saying, you know, most of it is six weeks. Most of it is on really university age subjects. And they haven't sort of gone through life like we have yet. They haven't sort of started that aches and pains and, and the body's beginning to break down process. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. We do need to sort of be much more specific and much more sort of looking at a, the longer durations and looking at sort of like a more age relevant and condition relevant aspect of things. Uh, yes. And of course, when you, when you look at the literature, and I cannot say that I have all, that we have all the literature that we have, but I started to collect literature already a long time ago, then was um, a bit more formalized at my time at university in, in Belgium, and I continue with this, and I think we have something like uh, four to 5,000 articles on aquatic exercise, aquatic therapy, and everything that is around it, so um, quite a bit. And when you look at clinical trials, of course, then you see many that indeed are related to strength and to range of motion. That is all okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but finally, for instance, something like resilience yeah, or self-efficacy are also very important topics. Uh, I mean, um, yes, I can live a little bit less extension of my knee, um, but when I'm in the downs, <clears throat> And, and I can change this by aquatic therapy and teach, and, and teach, you know, here in the pool, you can move yeah, as a yeah. kind of conversation for things that you cannot do. And this helps us resilience. I think it's much more important than my knee extension. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, when I did um, one on sort of quality of life, the thing that I, I learned as well was that when people were filling in this, the questionnaire on their quality of life, they were saying, well, no, my quality of life hasn't improved because again, now I've got, because I did back pain, but now I've got knee pain. And you're thinking, I didn't want to know about your knee pain. I was just asking about the back pain. <laughs> and then one, another lady had written, no, my quality of life hasn't improved because now my husband's poorly <laughs> type thing. So I think we, we also, <laughs> we need to make sure that we, we get the information that we actually want um, to make it sort of more valid, but you know, yeah, 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 okay, when, you, um, when you write. <laughs> yes, yeah, indeed. I, uh, <clears throat> um, there are many aspects, of course, eh? and uh, I, I have seen um, um, hundreds of thousands of patients in you as well. And of course, people uh, react differently. And yeah, in terms of pain, you have to distinguish between yeah, let's pain where there's a tissue problem and pain yeah, behavior and everything yeah. in between. And you have to do different things. And, that is what I learned already a long time ago. I told you that the rehab centers um, also had a big department of rheumatology. In fact, one of the three big centers of rheumatology and um, one of our core businesses in rheumatology was uh, outpatient aquatic therapy. Uh, so they all came. And so then about 30 years ago, we started to make an algorithm <laughs> already, yeah, clinic, this, a clinical decision scheme um, in order to, to find out uh, which patients would finally need a pain behavioral approach yeah, based yeah. at that moment on the Tampa scale of kinesiophobia amongst others. Uh, I like uh, that. I like that questionnaire. That's a good yeah. one. And basically above the cutoff, I think it was 45. And I remember uh, yeah, we said, okay, we just play. We just play in the water. Yeah? And then of course you have different, different coping behaviors and then you discuss this. Um, amongst a cup, of coffee, a cup of coffee afterwards or with a psychologist, depending on the setting. Yeah, yeah. but anyway, these things belong together uh, then also. And, Absolutely. And then about playing and, 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 and games. Um, of course, Halliwick is, 
yeah, start with children. So uh, Halloween, Halloween games are famous in the world, etc. And for a long time, I used to say, wonderful, but the insurance company doesn't pay for playing. And <laughs> I've changed my mind again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because actually, it's very important, of course, in life. Yeah, then. Yeah. But it has to be a therapeutic, uh, there has to be a therapeutic goal. So yeah. nowadays, I call this a cortic exergaming. Ah, um, very in order to in order to stimulate the as for instance the executive functions yeah um, uh, that are quickly uh, degenerated when you get older and then more specifically in parkinson and alzheimer and so on and, uh, and multiple sclerosis also mm -hmm. yeah yeah so instead of um, doing the obvious exercise of can you lift your ten your knee ten times to say it black and white yeah, we do quite different things and that is say, okay, we do, uh, for instance, uh, five different ac activities, whatever it is, and then ask a patient if they can randomize those activities uh, in three ways. And so make people think. Yeah. Uh, and then with a little bit of exertion <laughs> uh, and some fun. Yes, because sometimes people say to me, oh, oh, don't you do like three sets of, let's say, knee lifts and things like that. And I say, well, no, what I do is maybe one set of knee lifts, but I said, I'll also do this exercise, which includes knee lifts and this one. So I said, they've still got their three sets, but in three different ways. Cause you know, we are, we're as human beings, we move differently all the time. And that, and that's that sort of that ran the random movements is uh, how we need to train, I think. Yeah. And that brings me also to, no topic that's indeed this this variability of movement mm -hmm. huh? our movements are as variable as you can think of yeah even um the best circus player in juggling um will not will not throw the ball yeah in the same loop as the other one there are always differences so yeah. um there's variability and this is also that something that we try to to um to focus on in the pool yeah, well, lots of colleagues, for instance, when you look at gait training, yeah, they want to have a kind of movement that's more or less the same as on land, um, where, which is impossible because there's another environment. And anyway, yeah, when it's snowing outside, I don't walk in the same way um, as when I'm barefoot on, on, on hot beach, so to say. Absolutely. So you need to train this variability. Um, and then um, that also means that so knee lift uh, uh, it's nice, but you can do it in different ways. Eh? Because, you know, if you uh, try to walk um, through a uh, high wet grass um, or high snow, then already or, or, yeah, you have your knee lift, so to say, uh, without actually focus on it. Um, so varying exercises yeah, is uh, one of the most important things of um, going into another environment. I mean, that's a kind of it's automatic. Yeah, you cannot walk exactly the same way in water as you walk on land. No, no, absolutely. Well, to, for one thing, you haven't got the same gravity going through. So, <laughs> so it's no. A... Well, okay, the gravity is the same, but of course, your buoyancy is different. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. It's always it's always the battle between the English and the Greek between <laughs> Newton and Archimedes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> no, it doesn't change, does it? <laughs> Uh, no, because in water, Archimedes always wins. I mean, that's yeah. a bit going into <laughs> the pool. Yeah. Absolutely. I remember years ago, my, my brother, who's very good at sort of like mathematical equations and, and anything like that. And we were saying about physics. And I said, oh, I don't do physics. And he said, what do you think you do every day that you're in the pool? He said, yeah, of course. About physics. <laughs> oh, it is applied physics that is, uh, that is clear. Yeah. yeah. But, and... Of course, the, um, the hydrodynamics, hydrostatics, so fluid mechanics is very, very complicated. Um, mm -hmm. This Macmillan, he was an engineer in fluid mechanics. Yes. Um, and um, when he died, his, um, his widow then gave all the library to us. So I still, wow. have his books on, I still have his books on fluid mechanics. Wow. And I have to say, I still have them all. No. Um, <laughs> when, you look, when you look at, for instance, the... Uh, the equation of Bernoulli, yeah, then you can reduce it to where it's something simple. But when you look at the mathematics behind, yeah, that's enormous. Yeah. And, um, 
that already is clear also from my spring period when I attended various conferences on biomechanics and medicine and swimming, yeah, that uh, the experts, yeah, now you talk about Olympic level experts and research, etc. cetera, mm. say we don't understand fluid mechanics. So I think we should be humble as therapists and say we also don't understand really. Yeah, the yes. basis we know, we know a little bit. Um, and one of um, the persons who quite recently, in fact, um, put it in a nice article again. Jesse Lauer, he is from France, but um, it was research that for his PhD was done in, in, in Portugal, was about arm movement in water based on, on various mathematical models, where when you look at um, the moments in the joint and the torques and, uh, and, and our muscles uh, are active, then just going to the last thing that is activity of muscles in terms of the normal um, intermuscular coordination that we always work on needs for an arm uh, um, a speed of about 180 degrees per second. Um, so all movements that are really lower do not really address um, in an optimal way uh, this coordination in fact. Now when you look, just look at YouTube, then uh, aquatic therapy, you see that most of the little films that you see, yeah, have movements that are so slow, yeah, where you cannot expect to have any adaptation in um, in musculature or in the in the whole uh, musculofacial facial chain uh, there. Um, wow. Yeah, so there is still lots to do. There is. Uh, in the, uh, in the area of aquatic therapy and. Um, and I hope, of course, that also when I will not do this anymore at some moment, I mean, I don't think I will be able to active for another 40 years, <laughs> <laughs> um, that other people take over. And that's why also we started the IATF to educate young yeah. engaged therapists yeah, to continue with these thoughts and develop new thoughts, of course. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, as I say, so it's like my quest to bring aquatic therapy much more into the sort of normal aspect of things in the UK because at the moment it's very much a them and us and there's that massive gap in between between the physical therapists and the hydrotherapy in the pool and the fitness side of things and I think you know that that, that gap needs to be bridged to actually create a, a better sort of environment for the clients and the, and the patients and things. Because I was, especially over here with the NHS where you tend to get sort of half a dozen sessions and, and not even that sometimes. I've heard some of my clients say they've only got three sessions and yeah. who looks after them. And that, that's what I call myself. I call myself a rest of life specialist because I don't, I'm not a physiotherapist. My degree was rehabilitation and injury prevention, but you know, I sort of like acknowledge that the areas that I'm not an expert in, but like to sort of, you know, when they finished with the acute side and that sort of very specialist side that they can come to me and I'll, I'll help them to try and get to where they want to be. So I do see a lot of people with the MS and I do see a lot of stroke and I see a lot of people sort of post cancer and I see um, a lot of people who've had spinal surgery because we are a spinal specialist hospital where I am mm -hmm. and sort of take all these people onto the sort of next levels and things. So, yeah, I think there's, there's a, there's a big gap there and that, that's sort of my to do before I die is to try and help to bridge that gap over here. <laughs> well, yeah, for this, I think we have part the same goals because, um, that's also what's important for me. Um, that's you work in a team, and one of the topics, for instance, I have when I when I um, just go back to dosage, is of course that you have all the um, information uh, of the background knowledge that you need about exercise physiology. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, is not always automatically included in the physiotherapy curriculum. Yeah. yeah. And so then work together with others. Uh, and that also counts for other topics, of course. So the more people work together, the better it is, um, to my opinion. And as I said, that's why in, also in the courses, 
Uh, we allow we allow more people, and that always gives very interesting discussions. Also, and I myself, I learned so much from adaptive physical education um, professionals in our in our in our rehab center, occupational therapists that would come into the pool. Uh, also, that um, are frankly uh, don't ask me anything about common physiotherapy on them because that's uh, that's history, so to say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Other things. Yeah. 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 I know that one of my colleagues here in the UK has been doing a lot with um, speech therapists in the pool. Yeah. Um, you know, and that that's quite amazing when you think about what they can do. It makes sense, really, even when you think about it, you know, sort of breath control and blowing and, and using the water is, I think, you know, it does make mm -hmm. it'd be interesting to see. I think she's, she's writing a paper on that, so. Yeah, and... Um about papers in this area, there is a very interesting paper of a speech therapist from, from Chile that was published mm -hmm. a few years ago. And that has been uh, used in a Spanish book on uh, correct therapy, Terapia Aquatica, um, by, by some colleagues. So, so that the editors are two colleagues from, from Spain, uh, Javier Gueta, who is one of our members, um, and Maria Alonso, she is from, uh, from Madrid. There. So in the second edition of this book, they included two chapters on speech therapy in water. Um, and it was really quite interesting. Uh, also from a point of oriofacial therapy. Um, so I adapted myself also based on my uh, learning from speech therapists uh, that blowing bubbles for five seconds is not the only thing you can do. You can do so many things um, in the pool. Um, the only thing is that we should some we should realize something that is about inhaling and not always exhaling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> about the yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. I find um, I try and do sort of quite a lot of uh, breath control in the water with I've got a young lad with Duchenne's and I sit there and think, you know, he needs to obviously exercise his lungs. So we do a lot of sort of blowing activities and you know, sort of gain things in the pool to try and exercise that aspect as well. Yeah, no, 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 no. <clears throat> there are many things, um, many things in this area. And of course, that's one of the topics that we don't know so much about in, in uh, once again, physiotherapy. So, so that and not as a speech therapist uh, is nice, but my joke always is that it's not easy to get speech therapists in the pool yeah, because they need a mirror. Um, and that is always allowed. <clears throat> but when you're lucky, you know, yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. You can. So, have it. so where where are you sort of like heading now with um, with the things that you're doing? What's what's your next project? Well, we have a couple of things. Uh, um, one of the the things we hope to to work on is the next one. Um, last November. WHO uh, published a paper on the importance of physical activity for people in general with some chapters in their publications on people with chronic diseases, uh, on youth and elderly uh, with or without disability also. And um, I've been involved in some, in some WHO project, a project in the past so when I read this, I thought, oh, what do you have done seven years ago? Yeah, it has been lost in, in WHO. Because in this paper, <clears throat> um, position statement or guidelines, in fact, um, they mentioned the word swimming only once. And you talk about 200 pages or whatever. Yeah. And no, um, and nothing about aquatic therapy. Yeah, where at the same time they say, uh, physical activity is only important for the brain, but then you have to use the brain. And then you come to <clears throat> uh, how to use the brain in movement. And that's mostly for those executive functions, as I mentioned, for instance, in fall prevention. Eh? So that's a bit the link <clears throat> then. So I contacted the, the main author on the headquarters in Geneva. I also live there, but um, WHO is a, is more difficult to reach than, than, than the Pentagon, so to say. <laughs> um, but anyway, there was some contact. And then we decided with the three physio groups that 
are English speaking, yeah, as mother language, uh, mm -hmm. Australia, United States, and and and, and United Kingdom, um, to work together as four stakeholders in order to to try to convince WHO that it's not only important to think about um, swimming in terms of the Paralympic Committee or the the the, the FINA, the FINA. Um, but also perhaps with, with physiotherapy groups. I mean, there are no other worldwide aquatic therapy groups in terms of occupational therapy, for instance, so therefore physiotherapy. Um, to see if we can develop something that is about those executive functions. Yeah? So using the brain in a movement control for prevention and then in those people that do have brain problems, which finally is not only um, restricted to the groups I mentioned, like Alzheimer, and multiple sclerosis, and um, uh, and Parkinson, but also to diabetes um, in general. So we come back to lifestyles and um, and prevention <clears throat> and prevention of the neuroinflammation yeah, that develops because that's then and then back to COVID. Yeah, that's one of the big topic. That was one of the big topics yeah, in the um, in severe. Uh, results of, of uh, uh, COVID contamination. So with those groups, we, we hope to, to work together with WHO and when WHO um, uh, doesn't find it too important, then we continue um, with this. And uh, in order to make a kind of, yeah, once again, guidelines, position statement, we have to see about the importance of aquatic therapy, including those, uh, those aspects that I, uh, uh, that I mentioned, uh, executive functions, and I gave an example before. And the other topic, and of course, we want to, to promote this in courses also, to say how, what, what does this mean practically then. Yeah. And the other topic, yeah, is to, um, uh, is to explain the researchers in aquatic therapy that they have to, to take care in the publications, that they have to prepare their the trials well, yeah, to select their patients well, to give exercises that are related to the goals of the patients, to use measurement instruments that are related to the exercises, because otherwise the result of lots of our trials will always be that there is some advantage, but you know you need to have big groups and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, there. Yeah. So these are the things that we, uh, at this, at this moment um, are discussing in the IATF. Uh, and the third one now is if we should write a statement on the importance of aquatic exercise and long COVID. Yeah, not post COVID, but long COVID. Yes, I'm, I'm very interested in uh, doing some work with some long COVID patients because I, I do think that's probably one of the best places for them to be is in the pool. Um, yeah, it could be, but we don't know, eh? because yeah. there's, there's not so much known about, about this. Yeah. And um, yeah. so, and to date, yeah, most of the, of the results are anecdotal. It doesn't yeah. matter when you collect them. And if someone, when you have a group, yeah, you see a kind of um, direction in which probably you could work uh, mm -hmm. on things that are important using water or things that are not important using water. Yeah, well, it's back to that holistic approach. They need the land and the pool. So I think- Yeah, clearly. Um, well, on my own partner at Long Covid, she's working uh, uh, working half days in the pool, the pool, the pool in Geneva where she works opened again in June. Mm -hmm. um, um, so actually she's, uh, she's uh, working with children. So she has three children in the morning and then, uh, then it's fine working half yeah. days now. Um, but from her story, there is not so much a difference uh, okay. then, no. But okay, that's, you know, just an anecdote that also, yeah. Um, yeah. you don't know. I suppose and, also, because she, she's working with others, she's not actually working on herself. So she's not, you know, so as you say, it, ne it needs the research. It needs someone out there to actually do the research and, and yeah, you could imagine. So when you hear these stories of, of the long haulers, yeah, that they are only able to, to put one bag of waste outside, and then yes. they're tied for the rest of the day. 
then I don't think that aquatic therapy will help very much because you make them so tired by dressing and undressing. <laughs> yes, there is there is that as well. I yeah, I have um, I've said that to various people about you know you have to think about the dressing and the undressing as a workout as much as going into the pool, and that has to be planned as as well. So no, you're you're absolutely correct. I think it's it's well, it's back to where we sort of started really. And that that is saying that it has to be that you get sort of the, the same people with the same symptoms, but as human beings, we don't all have the same symptoms. So it, it'll be a tough, a tough one to have evidence-based, I think. Yes, indeed. But anyway, so we have a group of um, dedicated people in our association yeah, in which we discuss all these kinds of things. And if something comes out, we don't know, but at least we use our brains and uh, yeah, we try to, uh, to, combine, to combine the experiences that we have. Uh, we have 18 people from, from many countries in the world but then yeah, with the, the, the theoretical knowledge. And um, yeah, so that is an important, uh, important thing. Finally, it's the idea to have some output that is practical and uh, practical yeah, for the rest of the world. Yes. Um, in terms of aquatic exercise, aquatic therapy, um, whatever name you want to put on it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's sort of, it's, it is that coming together and bringing us all, all in under that one umbrella instead of the, the segmented and separate aspects of it. So. Indeed, because we do know that aquatic therapy works. I mean, that's why I continued also with my experience with patients it works and you don't know always why, so you want to know why. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, finally, as I'd say to, to colleagues everywhere in the world, everywhere in the world you know, if you go to an insurance company, company. And, and you can tell the insurance company, yeah, Lombeck says it works, then they will say it was Lombeck. So you have to show, you have to show literature uh, yeah. then um, that has a good quality and better quality than we have at this moment. Although I have to say that the literature in aquatic therapy that I know of is not better or worse than the literature in any kind of area of healthcare. And sometimes we tend to forget this. That's true. That's true. And everyone can skew the answers um, whichever way they sort of want it to come out. That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, that's always a confounding thing. That's always all bias. That's yeah. not... That's normal. Try, try I mean, we all, we, yes. Look, you choose for something and you want to make your bread, you want to make your living with it, and you want to eat bread. Yeah. So nobody will so what I no will say what I'm doing is really shit. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh dear. Okay. Um, well, I don't think I've got any more questions for you is there anything that you think you'd like to bring up and you'd like to bring to people's attention um, well, I, I think in, in in conclusion is that I would like to ask colleagues when we're in the pool um, first of all to collect data you know, yeah. write down what you do it doesn't have to be very scientific but write down what you do but then and try to relate your activities to what a patient really needs on land, then also. Um, unless, as I say, you do delf dolphin therapy, that means therapy with disabled dolphins, then you don't need land. You know, that's yeah. all based uh, on, on water movements then. Um, so we're critical. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, and at some moment, you know, there will be enough data to say, you know, I, I think I should tell it to other people. Yeah, also, um, uh, but um, uh, most important is yeah, to, um, to do things in the pool that are difficult to achieve on land, that is clear. Um, so to stop then with one anecdote of a patient, um, we had this course a while ago somewhere in the world where we had a group of um, adult patients with MSK problems. And the one I have in mind is somebody that had a, a total knee, a knee arthroplasty. And I asked him, um, what are you doing? What is your main goal, etc." I said, you know, I'm working 
<clears throat> in the hills around this uh, this city. And I, I did walk in the hills around the city for the whole day. He was retired. Yeah, and he could walk in the woods yeah, for seven hours a day, etc. cetera, and enjoyed. And then at that moment, after the surgery, months after the surgery, he could only walk for four hours. And he wanted to walk again for eight hours. And then we were in the tiny pool of something like nine square meters. Mm -hmm. And one of the colleagues found, and then I come back to the hyper to the knee extension. Yeah, that's, um, there was a bit too much or too less, I forgot, uh, knee extension at heel strike. Um, and so then with discussion, do you really think that trying to change the knee extension at heel strike will help this man uh, to walk another four hours more in the, uh, in, uh, in the wood? Do you think we can achieve this in this pool? Uh, no. Uh, this is something that has to be trained by walking in those hills, in those woods, and not yeah. in a nine square meter pool. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, I think, as I say, I know that you have other commitments, Johan, and you're a very busy gentleman. So I've had a really nice time talking to you and learned lots. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed it as well. And uh, at that point, I think we can say goodbye to each other for now. I'm sure yes, we will. Indeed. Yes, and, and I also enjoyed it very much. It's always nice to talk about aquatic uh, activity in general with a colleague. Absolutely. Yes, we share the same thoughts and, and, and experiences. Yeah, and hopefully, um, and once again, other people can, uh, can enjoy also edited versions yeah. then. So Absolutely. thank you very much, Linda, for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you and thank you for coming and, and chatting this morning. And say, so hopefully we'll see each other again in the not too distant future once uh, some of this craziness has calmed down in the world. Um, yes, it should, it should calm down at some, at some moment, yeah. uh, although I'm still postponing courses. Yes, yes, unfortunately. So only when we pick up um, yeah. where we, yeah. uh, where we uh, stopped um, uh, last year. Absolutely. Indeed. So hopefully, as I said to you earlier, before we started recording, that we will be able to get you over to the UK to run a course with us. So if anybody is interested, um, then maybe they can sort of contact me and I'll get in touch with you again, Johan, to do a Halliwick course over here in the UK. Yes, indeed, or a course in water specific therapy, yeah, because yeah. Um, maybe I should add, look, um, Halliwick originally is motor learning in the pool for the pool. Yeah, swimming, where what specific therapy is motor learning in the pool based on Hellevik ideas for land. Yeah. So, okay, so maybe it makes well, yeah, that's, that's a slight difference in concept, of course. Absolutely. And um, but we do have ideas actually to see if we can organize a uh, next isobat uh, mm -hmm. in England. Then, oh, will fantastic! Be or, it will be two or three years then. Yeah, but um, we started to think and to talk about this. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Oh, yeah. that, that'd, be, that'd be superb if it did. So, um, well, we'll keep everyone informed and we'll keep them all up to date with uh, what's going on and any courses that we can offer. And um, Follow social media and you'll find it. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I know you sent me something as well in Messenger the other day. Yeah. So. Thank you, Johan. Enjoy You're the welcome. day and uh, we look forward to meeting you again soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.